Well, welcome. We're uh, wanting to get into the Word together. Acts chapter 2. <clears throat> feel a little nervous about this morning. Uh, I don't know that I've ever really done this. If you look at your sermon notes, uh, they are the same as they were last Sunday. So we're going to preach the same sermon. We didn't get through it last Sunday. We did not get through the sermon. We only got about a third. And by popular demand, I'm going to preach it again. Well, that's a little stretching it. Many ask me to preach it again. Well, some, some ask me. <laughs> there were a few. <laughs> One. <laughs> Anyhow, we're going to walk over this material again, and hopefully uh, we won't get bogged down into what we did uh, last Sunday, but we'll move on to the conclusion of it, and uh, we're anxious uh, to do that. So thank you for your patience. The students, bless their hearts, they've gone through this. This will be the third time. <laughs> So, uh, we're looking at Acts chapter uh, 2, and uh, the verse, of course, is verse 42. Uh, Peter's given this explanation of Pentecost, and in the uh, explanation there has been this strong appeal to a group of Jews who have literally been cut to the heart. And they, of course, have uh, moved from one uh, location to another, that is, they've moved from the crucifixion of Christ and uh, being a part of that crowd and that culture that crucified Christ, they have been subtracted out of that and have been planted into a new location. Their new location is the person of Jesus himself. So they are now embracing the Christ that they actually had crucified, which is the position of every one of us who are experiencing Jesus in our lives. We have been yanked out of the culture and the environment and the surroundings and the will and the atmosphere that nailed Jesus, and we've been planted into a new location. Not physically, but planted into this new location, which is Jesus himself. And in the embrace of his person, we have become new. And as he begins to describe this location, he um, does it in this paragraph. In fact, from verse 41 down through verse 47, uh, he describes it in uh, vivid details of what was going on uh, in the early church. And in verse 40 it says, And with many other words Peter testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, in the breaking of bread, and in prayers. Jesus, we... Uh, yield ourselves to whatever the new location does in us. We've not come to dictate if I'm going to be with you, Jesus, you're going to have to have these activities in my life. We've come to say we're at your feet and however you want to spill in and through us and whatever you want to do with us and however you want us to respond and whatever attitude you want us to have, but you know how difficult this is for us, Jesus. This whole business of the cross. And, and I don't have any problem with you, but my problem is with all these other people. I don't know what to do with them. And relationship with each other is really tough. And how we're to respond and how we are to respond rightly to each other. And it seems like every situation is different than any other situation. And and we all have emotional ties and all of that gets played into it. And God, I don't know what to do with all of this except come and fall at your feet and say, please, in my day in and day out function of life, let me be so sensitive to your voice. Let me have the whispering of God in my ear. May I be so in tune with your heart and your mind that out of me will come what you are all about in the lives of people and my relationships with others. To that end, we commit these moments together. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I want to emphasize again at verse 42 that there is a verb that's not translated. And the verb also gives you the subject, and the subject is they, and the verb is were. They were. It's in the imperfect tense which has the idea of keeping on. 
It's something that happened in the past and continues into the present. So the idea of the verb is to keep on. So you've got this whole emphasis, and that shows up consistently throughout this paragraph. The idea of they were keeping on in this. They didn't, this was not a one-time deal. This was not for a brief moment. This was a constant keeping on. They were always into this. This was the pattern. This became the established pattern of their lives. Now, he double emphasizes that in verse 42 by saying, not only were they in this state of being that just kept on, they were continuing in this atmosphere, they were continuing in this uh, state of mind, they were continuing in this focus, however you want to relate that, they were continuing in that. And then he adds the word, continued steadfastly. So that's a whole other word all of its own. So it's there in double emphasis for us, like, oh, I really want you to get this, he says. They're in this state of being that was just keeping on, and they continued steadfastly in that state of being. So that Christianity, and we're, we're just going to keep pounding this, Christianity is not a series of activities. Christianity is not a doing thing. Christianity is not, I do this, therefore I am. Christianity is a state of being. It has to do with inwardness. It has to do with the reality of in intimacy with the person himself who now indwells you. It has not to do with I come to church. It has not to do with the good I do. It has not to do with the career of preaching. It has not to do with teaching. It has to do with who you are inside as he has come to indwell you and you are in that state of being. That ought to be so simple, shouldn't it? A state of being. He emphasizes that. Now, the reason he emphasizes that is because then in verse 42, he's going to give you four activities that they were involved in. There is the teaching, the apostles' doctrine, and the fellowship, and uh, the breaking of bread, and the prayers. But those are four activities that spilled out of the state of being. If you don't start with the state of being, then you get all wrapped up in the activities and you think that Christianity is the activities, but it's not. It's the state of being that happened to fill into these four activities. Now, these four activities could have been five. Oh, they could have been three. Oh, they could have been six. Let's go all out and make it seven. But it doesn't matter because the state of activities is flexible with the condition of the culture, who we are, the people that we are, what we're involved in, the needs of the hour, all of those things fluctuate the activities. The activities are not the deal. The state of being is the deal, and it flowed into these four activities for the early church. Now, we've talked about these, of course, and the first one is, we're walking through them, the first one is the apostles' doctrine which is the apostles really teaching. Don't let the word doctrine get to you. It's teaching. So the apostles were teaching something. What was the teaching? Resurrected Christ. No way to get out of that. All the way through the book of Acts, the, this, the apostles were constantly just pounding this idea. In fact, they gave up the waiting on tables that they may, might concentrate on being a witness to the resurrection, resurrected Jesus. It's not that they were teaching that Jesus was resurrected, the event. They were teaching he is resurrected, the living person. So it wasn't a focus on an event, and they described the event that's past now and it's over. No, it's the fact, whoa, Jesus is alive, and you can know him. Jesus is alive, you can embrace him. Jesus is alive, you can live with him. Jesus is alive, he wants to indwell you. Jesus is alive. So the whole focus was not on some event. It was upon the fact, whoa, he is alive. That was their teaching. Now, this spilled into fellowship, which the actual word you remember is the word business, so they got into the enterprise, the business. They went into business with Jesus. Oh, isn't that exciting? Hey, they gave everything they had. Jesus gives everything he has. And they went into became business partners with Jesus. So their lives now became a business adventure with the person of Christ. They rolled out of bed in the morning and say, Woo, I'm going down to whatever job I have. I can't really say that because I've never worked in my life. But I'm going down to the job I have, and I'm, hey, I'm not just going to that job. I'm in business with Jesus. This has eternal significance in the job, which is really significant. Uh, then we came to this breaking of bread. Uh, you'll remember that the breaking of bread was a 
slogan, a, a phrase that was used for the eating uh, style of the Jews. And so it bespeaks, obviously, a meal. Jesus used this procedure. It was at the beginning. We went through these. There were four of them, uh, and we gave you the scriptures. We're not going to do that again because the breaking of bread was a Jewish meal. But the whole thing began to expand through the early church into the Lord's Supper. And if you'll note in the passage, verse 42, it says, in, in my translation, in the breaking of bread. In is not really there, so strike that out. The is definitely there, a definite article before the breaking of bread, which means it's taking the phrase from the general to the specific, telling you that this phrase has early church connotation to it. Now, you realize that Luke was writing this several, several many years later after the early church had already been established, and he's looking back. And so he wrote into it this idea of the breaking of bread. And all Bible scholars agree that the breaking of bread had the idea of they got together for a supper, and then at the close of the supper, they had the Lord's Supper. They did communion, and that the meal was all tied in with the communion thing. So their fellowship around the table had the cross planted right in the middle of it. So that the fellowship of what was going on with the early church believer, he's been yanked out of his culture which crucified Christ, he's now been brought into intimacy with Jesus, and he views everything in his relationship through the cross that he himself had participated in. Through the death of Jesus, he views all of his relationship. Really significant. So as you look at the whole flow of what's going on, they're dwelling in a state of being. This state of being spills into the activities of, oh, focusing on the apostles' doctrine, learning the apostles' teaching, the revelation of the person of Jesus, which is all about resurrection from the dead, which is this whole, uh, this whole dynamic of his life. It's all about I'm in business partner with Jesus, and right in the middle of all of that is the cross. Now, as we looked at that uh, last Sunday, we began to talk about gathering together as a, ship, as a body of believers. See, I have a little problem with Jesus dying for me, and I get off scot-free. I love that. Oh, I like that. See, I have no problem with that at all. But the awfulness of the cross is Jesus died for me. Whoops. He died for you, too. And somehow I got to deal with you. And to tell you the truth, I don't even like you, but I have to deal with you. I can see you sit, feel the same way. I feel the love. So here's the cross. And if you're going to take the cross and you're going to plant it in the middle of your life, obviously the cross is not only going to be in, involved in how I how I handle my body drives, how I handle my home, how I handle my kids. It's going to be involved in the fellowship meal, which is the symbol of the body of Christ, that we come together to eat, which is the fellowship idea, the connection, the body of Christ concept. And in the middle of that is this, is this Lord's Supper thing, which plants the cross in the middle of my eating. We do a lot of eating, don't we? Let's not get off on that. So here is the whole cross that's been planted into the middle of my relationship with you. So what I've been inviting you last Sunday and now this morning, I'm inviting you to come and let's have a meal together in light of the cross. What would that look like? If I'm going to fellowship, eat, link, if you and I are going to be together. And it's going to be, the cross is going to be planted in the middle of us being together. What would that look like? I'm suggesting to you two major ideas. One is that I must see you. I must see my relationship with you. It must be seen in light of the cross. And Jesus' death for me. I must see my relationship with you 
in light of his death for me. Now, that automatically, and we walk through two of these, automatically brings up three ideas. One is the idea of pardon. That means that I'm going to have to forgive you as Jesus forgave me. How did Jesus forgive me? Totally. I'm going to have to forgive you. How did Jesus forgive me? Totally. And he forgets. Well, I'll forgive him, but I'll never forget it. Then we can't have this meal. Well, I just can't forget. Could he help you? Could he make what happened between you and whoever, could he make that so insignificant in light of all of the forgiveness you've experienced from him, could he make that so insignificant that it doesn't matter? And we went through the parable that Jesus told, first of all, the Lord's Supper, then we went through the parable Jesus told, and we discovered the joke Jesus tells jokes. And the parable that he told was a joke. You remember it. It's so significant. This guy embezzled from the king $2,350,000 worth. The king came back, caught him, was going to sell him, his wife, his kids, the whole lot, get what he could. And then the guy begged him and he forgave him $2,350,000 worth. And after he had been forgiven, oh, it's all off my neck. The king didn't say, you got to pay me back. The king, the king didn't say, you got to wash my windows. The king didn't say, you got to come to church every Sunday. The king didn't say, the king just ripped up the note and said, that's it. You have no obligation to where I forgive you the whole lot. And the guy stepped out the door and found a fellow servant that owed him $16.69. Grabbed him by the throat. But you've just been forgiven $2,350,000. He owes me sixteen dollars. I, I ever, I loaned it to him in good faith. He oughta. I worked hard for that money. Did, did, uh, but you just, do you see the joke? You're not laughing. Not amazing. That's not my story, folks. That's his story. And there was no question at the end of the parable. He was saying, if we're going to come down and sit at the table and my cross is going to be in the middle of our relationship, yours, mine, and his, this, this is the attitude. This is the approach. I've got to forgive you like he's forgiven me. The second one, we just really begin to work on the second idea. If we're going to have a meal together and the cross is going to be planted in the middle of it, obviously, I'm going to see my, I'm, my relationships are going to be seen in light of Jesus' death, his cross for me. What does that mean? Number one, pardon. I'm going to forgive you as he's forgiven me. Number two, provision. I'm going to provide for you like he provides for me. This is really tough. How has Jesus provided for me? Oh, we read the scripture, uh, Ephesians 1, 3. We read the scripture how all, every spiritual blessing in the head, he has given every spiritual blessing to me. 
everything you can imagine in your mind that I could possibly need for my spiritual success. He's laid that out for me. He has provided totally. There isn't one little, well, he forgot that. There is no total. The word every is really significant in the passage. Every spiritual blessing, all the forgiveness, all the peace, all the power, all the security, all the stability, all the love, all the, all the, all the. In fact, he went on to say in Colossians 2, 9 and uh, verse 9 and 10, for in Jesus dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him. Oh, there's nothing left out. So in Jesus, in Jesus is the completeness of everything I need. He is the total provision. We all agree with that. And I think we all agree with the fact that the provision is not something he gives to me, it's something that he is. Manly, you say that nearly every Sunday. I know, but you've got to understand that. He doesn't give you salvation. He is your salvation. He doesn't give you power. He is power. He doesn't give you peace, and you go off and use it apart from him. He is your peace. So what do you need? Him. Because in him, he is he is everything. He is the totality of the provision. He himself. It isn't what he gives you when we use the word provide, the provision. We think in terms of giving something. He, no, how does he meet my need? Oh, he comes and he is the meeting of my need. Now, I'm going to provide for you. like he provides for me how does he provide for me doesn't give me anything he is I don't like this see I'm much I find much more comfort in flipping you ten dollars you have a need or you ten dollars Shut my door and lock it. Bent their knee. You need some food? Hey, there's a tray full. Help yourself. I like that. Because I it's not involved. It's that isn't the way he meets my needs. Hey, Lord, I need. Well, it came through the mail. <laughs> no, that is not the way he meets my need. He comes down and bangs on my door, man. That's Revelation 3.20. Bangs on my door and says, I want to come in. And I'm to open the door and he comes in and sups with me. Now, I don't, know how to, I don't know how to, I'm struggling to transfer this into, I can see that clearly in Jesus' relationship with me and how he provides by being within me, but then I relate it to you. How am I going to be that to you? Is there a possibility? Just think about this. Is there a possibility? I'm not for sure. Is there a possibility? that I could be so full of Jesus and Jesus could so source me that I could embrace you and become intimate with you and in that embrace, who he is in me could begin to be the stability, could begin to be the, the, the strengthening, could begin to be the light, could begin to be the, the, the peace in the middle of your, could I, could I, the Jesus in me, could he, could he get close to you enough to pull down the walls so that you could begin to see him? But you see, there's no ego in that. See, there's a lot of ego in, well, bless God, I, I fed him. I, fe I feed the poor. I give the... I paid the guy's light bill. See, there's a, 
That's a lot of. But see, this is way beyond that because this is embracing you to the point that he literally that somehow uses me to become your provision. What would that look like? How would that feel? Well, that's where last Sunday's sermon ended. We're almost out of time. <laughs> the third one is proscription. Proscription means, uh, is the act of condemning. If you look it up in the dictionary, it means to denounce or to condemn. So it has to do with judging. So if, I'm going to, if we're going to gather together around the table and the cross is going to be planted in the middle of this thing and my relationship with you is going to be seen in light of his death for me, I'm going to have to forgive you as he forgave me. I'm going to have to provide for you as he's provided for me. And I'm going to have to judge you as he judges me. Well, how has he judged me? This is so out of sight. <clears throat> Go to 2 Corinthians 5, 21. We actually sung it. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. That we might become the righteousness of God in him. Listen to it. He made him. God made Jesus who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Here's Jesus. Never sinned. No condemnation. There's nothing to judge in him. He is holy. He is righteous. Here I am. I haven't done a good thing in my life. Full of sin. Full of evil. Crucified Christ. I'm the chief of sinners. Sin doesn't have to do with the deeds you did. It has to do with the nature you are. Well, Manly, you never smoked a cigarette. You never drank a can of beer. So? Well, how could you be the chief of sinners? Never committed adultery. So? That's a symptom, man. Something in... The scripture says if you've broken the law of God at one single point, you've done this right, you've done this right, you've done this right, you've done this right, you've done all the law of God, just exactly like it ought to be done. And just right down here is the last little one. Whoops, you messed up. You are guilty of the whole thing. I am as guilty as the worst. Well, yes. None of you can stand up and tell a story that I can't say, man, that's me. Not in deed, but intent and heart. There are no good sins, folks. Well, I didn't steal a million dollars. I only spent, stole 10 cents. It's not about the amount. So this is not about the deed. So none of us can, hey, here I am. Here he is. Do you know what God did? God took all the judgment that should come down on me and he literally took it and transferred it to Jesus and judged Jesus so that Jesus became my sin judgment so that I could become his we change places. 
and my sin became his sin, and his righteousness became my righteousness. Whoa! What a deal! That's how he judged me. We on track? That's how he judged me, man. He took all the judgment that he did not. It isn't, well, I'll just forget about it. No, he didn't just forget about it. He dealt with it, but he dealt with it in terms of Jesus became judged for in my behalf. And here I am. I become the righteousness of God. Now, if that's the way he's judged me, how am I going to judge you? And I have such skill in judgment. <laughs> oh, I can really judge well. <laughs> oh, man. And I've got some really neat words that go along with it when I judge people. How am I going to judge you? Oh, I know how I'm going to judge you. I'm going to take all of your sin and all of your guilt and all the stuff I should judge you about and I'm going to let God put that on No, I, well, I want to draw a line, build a wall. Stand back, look at you. I'm watching you. You messed up. I knew you would. Well, I knew you would. I could predict it. That isn't the way he judged me. The way he judged me is he took all of my guilt and he put it on Jesus. Now, how am I going to judge you like God judged me? He, I'm going to take... Think about this. Could God? Here you are in darkness. And let's not take you. Let's take me. Here I am in darkness. Here I am in, I'm struggling. I'm under. There's no way out for me. Yeah, I've been there. Here, here, here I am and I can't get over this. I can't get out of this. You know what God did? God brought somebody who was filled with the Spirit and they came alongside me and they began to so identify with me that my hurt, my, my bondage, my, my darkness, my, my inability, what I couldn't crawl out of began to be lightened enough like they were carrying that. And it began to be lightened enough that God could get through to me. And carry me out of that. Did that make any sense? Here I am in all the filth of my life. And man, you talk to the psychiatrist. They, hey, there's no way he's going to get out of that. He's just, he's too low. He's too, he's too bound. He's too, the patterns are too set. The, but see, God sent some godly person that was so filled with Jesus that he just, he came alongside of me. It was like he just picked up my burden and here's the burden of sin that I've been carrying and there's no way I'm going to straighten up. But somehow this guy identified with me and literally was used by God to help bear that burden until I became a part of the and he was I was able to see there was enough light that got through because somebody walked with me. Is that how God wants to use me? Are you open to that? Or would it just be a process where I sit back and just criticize And to tell you the truth, I've been going broke buying all the paper that it takes to keep track of what you do. Wouldn't it be something not to keep track anymore? <laughs> Think 
of the money I can say. Not to keep track anymore, but come alongside you and be a part of the, the bearing, the judging. The second major idea. We're going to have a meal together. And uh, the cross is going to be in the middle of it. And we're going to link. And we're going to walk together. And we're going to be the body of Christ in this place. Oh, the cross is going to have to be in the middle of it. That means I'm going to have to see my relationship with you. My relationship with you is going to have to be seen in light of Jesus dying for me. Also, it's going to have to be seen in light of Jesus dying for you. <laughs> That immediately brings up the subject of pardon. I must forgive you as he forgives you. Well, how is he forgiving you? Remember the joke Jesus told, the $2,350,000 of $16.69? 16, 16 Just, you know how he got into that joke? There was a pagan world out here. See it? It's massive. Just paganism, darkness, sin, meanness. Just, You know what the philosophy of the pagan world was in Jesus' day? The philosophy was, do to them before they do to you. Second guess them. Watch them, and when you anticipate they're going to do something, smash them before they smash you. If you think they're going to hit them, hit them first. That was the pagan world. And don't ever forgive that was the pagan world. Hey, do to them before they do to you, and don't ever forgive them. That's a pagan world. Now, right in the middle of this pagan, pagan world that had that philosophy, there's a little island called Judaism. And in this little island of Judaism, they had a different philosophy, came from God, Jehovah, Old Testament. And that was eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. That's a step up, brother. Big step up. See, the pagan world says, do to them before they do to you, and don't ever forgive them. The Jewish world says, do to them when they do to you, and only do what they did, and don't forgive them. Yeah. They hit you, you hit them. Hey, they poke your eye out, you poke their eye out. Hey, they knock out a tooth, you knock out their tooth. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Hey. What do you do to me? I'm going to do to you. That's called revenge, friend. And hey, I won't do any more. I'm a decent. Hey, you knock me down. I knock you down. You steal from me. I steal the same amount from you, man. And I'm never going to forgive you. So here's a pagan world with all of its evil that said, do to them, anticipate, get them before they get you, and don't ever forgive them. And here's the Jewish world that says, no, you wait till they get you, and then you get them back, and don't forgive them. That's a step up. It really is. Now, can you see Peter? Jesus is standing over here. Peter comes. He's been in this pagan world. He's been in this Jewish world. He comes to Jesus. And oh, by the way, at the beginning of the chapter, he's running for the number one disciple spot. He wants to be the number one disciple. They're arguing about who's going to be the greatest. So he comes running for the number one spot, wanting all the votes. So he's willing to be generous. It's a political speech. So he's willing to be generous. So he comes to Jesus and says, now, there's a pagan world that says, do to them before they do to you and don't ever forgive them. We live in a Jewish world that says, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Do to them what they do to you and don't forgive them. Jesus, how about this? Suppose I, when my brother does something to me, I forgive him. And I allow him to do it up to seven times before I nail him. Now, that's really generous. Especially when you only got two eyes. So, I mean, this is really generous. He thinks Jesus will like, say, oh, Peter, pagan world, terrible. Jewish world, better. But this is, whoa, are you willing to do that? Forgive seven times? Wow, Peter, you get the number one spot. See, it's a political speech. Jesus looks at him and says, oh, you know all this. Jesus looks at him and says, 
I don't tell you seven times. I tell you 70 times seven. It's 490 times. Yeah, 490 times. So I've got to keep track. That's going to take a lot of paper. 490 times. Then I can nail him? No, it's an Old Testament statement. And the Old Testament statement, 70 times 7, means, you know, that thing, that, that 8 that's on its side? Infinity. So he was saying, always forgive! Well, why should I always forgive them? Because Jesus always forgives them. In fact, let me remind you the, the language. Let's clear up the language here so that we're really clear. Jesus doesn't always forgive you. He has already forgiven you. <laughs> I just love this. And I just want to pound that every time I get a chance. See, you... You can't come to an altar this morning and say, Oh, Lord, I've sinned. Would you please forgive me? And God's going to turn to you and say, No, I can't forgive you this morning. Why? Because I already did it. <laughs> you're already forgiven. I can go around my world saying, You're forgiven. You're forgiven. You're forgiven. Everybody's forgiven. God has ever forgiven everybody. Does that mean everybody's going to heaven? No. Does that mean everybody's living in forgiveness? No. But everybody's been forgiven. Why? Jesus already did that. So if I'm going to forgive you like he forgives you, you know what that means? Can't forgive you. Sorry, already did it. <laughs> well, I'm asking it. Doesn't matter. Still treat you mean. Doesn't matter. Still rip you off. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Well, you're a sucker. I know. <laughs> But it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Well, don't let them do it again. Don't give them a second chance. What? If the cross is going to be planted in the middle of this thing, what are you talking about? I've not only got to forgive you as Jesus forgave me, but I've got to forgive you as Jesus forgives you. Oh, let's move to the second quickly. Not only is there this pardon thing, but there is this whole business of the provision. I must meet your need as he meets your need. See, if the cross is going to be planted in the middle of this, I've got to pardon you. I've got to see my relationship with you in light of the cross as how Jesus died for you. So I've got to forgive you as Jesus forgives you, and I've got to provide for you as Jesus provides for you. Well, how does Jesus provide? How does he meet your needs? There is a fundamental principle that spills off of the cross. The fundamental principle that spills off of the cross is, oh, man, this is hard. Your needs have priority over Jesus' needs. Would you agree with that? He's dying on a cross. Would you say, well, Jesus, what do you need? Well, I need to come down off this stinking thing. Well, he's not going to do that. Why? Because your needs have priority over his. I need the pain to stop. No, he's not going to do that. Why? Because your needs have priority over his needs. Well, I need people to love me and not hate me and yell at me. And... That ain't going to happen. Why? Because your needs have priority over his needs. He has set aside his needs for the sake of what? Your needs. So how does he provide for you? He sets aside his needs in order to provide for you. Your needs have priority over his needs. That's a fundamental. And the thing that's so irritating about that is that there's no personal advantage in that. 
Now, if you think this through, you'll see this. In other words, you can't come to Jesus who's dying on a cross and say, well, he just wants my money. That is so... He doesn't want your money. He thinks and streets of gold come into being. I don't think he needs your money. Now, I need your money. <laughs> but he doesn't need your money. <laughs> the church needs your money, but he doesn't need your money. So you can't look at him and say, well, he's just dying for me so he can get my money. <laughs> and if he's dying for you to get your money, he really blew it on some of you really bad. <laughs> Well, he, did, he, died, he died for me so, he could, so I would serve him. Oh, come on. That's ridiculous. Yeah, he just wants me to serve him, do stuff for him. I'm a glorified errand boy for God. <laughs> Angels were made by God as glorified errand boys. Not you. You're a son. <laughs> not a servant. So this is not about service. Never has been, but what you can do. See, there's nowhere you can come, no way you can come to the cross and come up to that cross and say that he's got a, an advantage, he's got a hidden agenda, he's got a... So if I'm, going to, if I'm going to meet your needs as Jesus meets your needs, how am I going to do that? I'm going to set aside what I need in order to meet your needs, and I'm going to have no agenda, no... Uh, no advantage, no, uh, come to our church, come to our church. Why? I'm trying to win a new Bible. <laughs> what? You're inviting me to come to your church so you can win a new Bible. Yeah, we got this contest, and if I bring the most new people, I get the new Bible. I'm not coming. You're not going to use me as some number on your board. You don't give a rip about me. You just want another cold, dead body in the sanctuary. You're using me. Come on, I wept over the bus thing. Most of you wouldn't know anything about this, but this is 20 years ago in the Church of the Nazarene. We bought all these buses. Bus ministry was the thing. We bought all these buses. I mean, every church bought buses. I know a church that had, ran about 250 in their congregation, and they had five buses. They bust in 50 kids on every bus. I mean, the sanctuary, I mean, the, the Sunday school classrooms, I mean, the the thing was crowded when the, when the bell rang. Get out of the hallway. There, here they come. I mean, it was just, whoa, whoa. they brought in so many. In fact, they got so they never let the kids get off the bus. They drove the buses into the parking lot, stood up and said, oh, Jesus loves you. Let's sing it together. Jesus loves me. And then they said, oh, time to go home. We'll stop by McDonald's on the way. And whoa. But put really look good on the number board. You think that's why we want you here? So we can count one more? That's awful. If I'm going to be in relationship with you as, and I'm going to provide for you as he provides, no agenda, no. I'm going to judge you as he judges you. This was uh, several years ago, and I'll quit with this. But uh, Everywhere I went, some gray-haired person would come up to me and say, oh, uh, of course, just got done preaching. They'd meet me at the door and shake my hand and say, you know, Brother Manley, 
What we don't hear anything about these days, what nobody seems to preach on, and we need a good hot sermon on it, is on hell. Everybody, we need to hear some good sermons on hell, brother. I tell you, hell, those people need to go. They're going to hell. And I, of course, just got done preaching, so. Uh, and I got, week after week, I heard that from, you know, a few gray years. So I really got serious about it. I said, well, you know, if God wants me to preach on hell, I'm going to preach on hell. I went to the scriptures. You can do this. And I looked up every place, every single place where Jesus preached or talked about hell. Every place. We've already mentioned it. Woman taken in the act of adultery. Wouldn't that be a great place to talk about hell? <laughs> they drug her right to the... She's committed adultery. Oh, we got stoned. Yes, sir. A red-hot sermon on hell. That'd be excellent. <laughs> Wouldn't it? He never mentioned it. And says, go and sin no more. Hey, well, good night. You missed a great opportunity. There's the Zacchaeus thing, this short guy. Crawls up in a sycamore tree. Cheater, tax collector, awful guy. Just cheats his, Jesus is coming along. Stops, looks at him. Says, get down here. This would be an excellent moment for a sermon on hell. Never mentions it. We talked about this last week. Says, I'm going for your house for tea. Do you know that the only place Jesus ever mentioned hell was at the staff meeting? Yeah, where the leaders of the church were. The disciple group, he talked to them about it. Pharisees, he talked to them about it. He never talked to those folks out there about it. Hey, I want to be biblical. So if you were biblical, when would you talk about hell? To the Christian people who come every Sunday. Because that's what Jesus did. So if I'm going to judge you like Jesus judges you, Lord, um, you're going to have to take all of this and process it in my heart and mind and uh, bring it into practical application as it lives through me. This is all so far out, so beyond my ability to grasp. But through it all, God, I see a tone. I see an attitude. I see an atmosphere. I see a heart. And I want that heart. I'm not sure about the application of all of it. I'm, I'm not sure about how it always plays out. I'm not sure about how every situation, because there's the woman taken in the act of adultery, then there are other times, and then there are other scenes, and there are other people, and, and God, I, I, I don't know how to play it all out, and I, I, don't, I don't know that there's any, any rule we can just set up and say this is a, how you'd respond in this situation, Lord, but I, there's a heart in this. And I want that heart. And I'm willing for your heart this morning to uh, adjust my thinking and shape my mannerisms and uh, change my approach. Please, Jesus. 
give me your heart. It's a bow and thank you for your kindness. Just going to take a brief moment for a response and uh, seeking Him and openness. Want to win your family, want to win your kids, want to win your neighbors, want to, want, want to impact the community, want to want to be the body of Christ. want to be a place where people just come because there's they don't like the music and the preaching is too long but oh there's something here the heart let's go after his heart Whatever that means, whatever walls come down, whatever it changes in my mind and heart, whatever, whatever it does to me. Would you let him give you his heart? Moments of secret.